So you don't stretch elections beyond their true meaning. And the half-life of an election is really quite, quite short. So uh, what does it mean for next year? You know, you can go back into history and say, well, you know, in most cases, it gave a hint of what was going to happen in the presidential race, but there were certainly cases where it didn't. So we need to focus on the present and the future, not what happened in a handful of races in early November of 2023. Prominent CEOs, leading economists, iconic investors, insights from the experts. The Walker Webcast with Willie Walker. See who's next. Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to another Walker Webcast. It is my great joy to have my friend, Dr. Larry Sabato, join me once again uh, at this time when um, there is, uh, we're a year away from the 2024 presidential election. We've just come out of some midterm elections that um, I look forward to hearing uh, Dr. Sabato's views on um, what happened a week before last as it relates to Virginia and Ohio and Wisconsin and a bunch of other um, uh, election results. Um, and I also want to spend time today, and we'll start there, talking about Larry's book on President Kennedy, which he wrote a decade ago, um, but it is entitled The Kennedy Half Century, The Presidency, Assassination, and Lasting Legacy of John F. Kennedy. Um, and given that we are now 60 years and two days uh, past that fateful day, um, I'd love to get his perspectives on, A, whether we know anything more than we did a decade ago when he wrote that book, uh, and talk a little bit about Kennedy's lasting legacy and some other pieces to the book that I found as I read it uh, really interesting as it relates to kind of harbingers of the political world we live in today, some things that we've changed and might have gotten right and some things that we potentially haven't changed and gotten wrong. Uh, quick intro of Dr. Salvador, even though many of you who have joined us on the Walker webcast before, know very well um, his background, but uh, real quick, and then we'll dive in. Dr. Larry Sabato is an American political scientist and political analyst. He is the Robert Kent Gooch Professor of Politics at the University of Virginia, where he's also the founder and director of the Center for Politics, which works to promote civic engagement and participation in politics. The Center for Politics is also responsible for the publication of Sabato's Crystal Ball, an online newsletter and website that provides free political analysis and electoral projections. Dr. Sabato is a graduate of the University of Virginia, where he was president of the student body, Princeton School of Public and International Affairs, and Oxford University, where he was a Rhodes Scholar and earned his PhD in political science. He has won four Emmy Awards. He has written over 20 books, and his most recent is A Return to Normalcy, the 2020 election that almost broke America. Um, so, Larry, first of all, thank you for coming on. I hope you had a, uh, a happy Thanksgiving in, in Charlottesville. Um, we were at, on the top talking about how both of us have been a little under the weather recently. And so uh, I'm glad to see that you're on the mend. And as you can tell by my voice, I feel like I'm on the mend, but I still sound like I'm a little sick. Let's talk about Kennedy's for a second, because it is 60 years um, since that fateful day in Dallas. Uh, and you studied not only President Kennedy as a president, but then also everything that went on around that day. Do we know anything more today, Larry, than we did a decade ago when you wrote that book as it relates to the conspiracy theories and release of documents around the assassination of Kennedy than we did a decade ago? Well, my shop at the Center for Politics carefully examines each new document that's released. Of course, there are still thousands of pages that haven't been released. They were supposed to be released in October 2017. And um, some of the agencies, especially CIA, some FBI and, and others, objected to the release of X, Y, and Z. Of course, we don't know what's in there. Uh, and others were released in a redacted fashion to the extent that you really don't know what they're about or they don't tell you anything. Uh, but we we review all of them. We'll continue to do that as as I assume uh, future releases will be occurring at I hope regular intervals. I did have an intelligence official tell me ten years ago when I asked him when will we actually see all these documents, and he said my guess would be 2063. That is the hundredth anniversary of the assassination. Uh, I don't know about you, but I'm planning on being dead by then, and I am not going to have a chance to go through the other ones. But anyway, we have we have uh, reviewed them, and I would I would summarize it this way: 
we actually have learned some interesting stories. We've, we've learned some interesting sidelights. We have learned more about uh, various conspiracy theories as alleged by people who contacted the FBI or the CIA or other agencies of government. Uh, what we haven't learned is anything, in my view at least, and millions of people disagree with me, but in my view, we haven't learned anything that would change the basic narrative of what we know about the assassination. Now, when I say that, if, if your audience is at all representative of the American public, two-thirds will disagree with me instantly because two-thirds of Americans, even now, 60 years later, believe there was a conspiracy. They do not believe that Lee Harvey Oswald was the only uh, shooter, or at least there could have been other people involved. I don't dispute because we didn't get a chance to interrogate him very extensively that Lee Harvey Oswald might, might have been encouraged to do this when he was in Mexico City and visiting the Soviet embassy and the Cuban embassy, or there may have been others. There were other suspect individuals that he seemed to come across uh, with some regularity. But in terms of other shooters, I'm sorry. You know, I've, I've studied this for years. Uh, you know, I was traumatized by the assassination. I was in Catholic school. Uh, I got involved in politics. Well, partly because my dad was a World War II vet and, and believed it was very important, but also because John F. Kennedy just happened to come to my town, Norfolk, Virginia, four days before the election. And my dad took me out to a big rally and uh, I was so excited because there were tens of thousands of people there and they were so excited. And it it addicted me uh, to the extent that that uh, I've always stayed interested in politics. But uh, having said that and having myself jumped down the rabbit hole for years and years and years, I, I believed there was a conspiracy without having the background knowledge other than the Warren Commission. And uh, I don't blame the staff. I say that because the, the few remaining living staff members uh, will jump down your throat very quickly if you, uh, if you utter a word of criticism of what they did. But my criticism is that they weren't told some of the critical information that they should have had access to and that members of the commission, real members of the commission, not staff members like Alan Dulles, the fired CIA director who was put on this commission. He was fired by Kennedy. I've always found that curious. Um, they knew about all these assassination attempts by the Kennedy administration against Fidel Castro. Uh, and among other things, there are loads of things that were relevant to the Kennedy assassination. And the commission was kept completely in the dark. Uh, so, you know, I, I have my doubts about parts of the story. I certainly have doubts about the Warren Commission report, again, not because of the staff, but because of what they were told by the members and by the, the leaders of the CIA and and um, to some degree the FBI, though I have to say Jagger Hoover was more forthcoming because it was just perfectly obvious that they had screwed it up. They were following uh, and checking in with Oswald uh, with some frequency. And incredibly, he had even gone to the FBI headquarters in Dallas just a, a, a little bit before the assassination, angry that one of the, the um, FBI agents, Mr. Hostie, had uh, gone to see his wife and threatened him and the FBI uh, and indicated that he would blow up the headquarters of the FBI if they came to see his wife again. Normally, you know, that would, uh, that would cause me, if I were an FBI official, uh, to uh, call him in for close questioning and maybe to have him arrested. Uh, well, certainly in this day and time, we would. Uh, but he was allowed to go and he was still there waiting by the elevators when somebody read the note. So there are so many pieces of it that are pure incompetence. There are pieces of the Kennedy assassination that are inexplicable. There are pieces of the assassination that have been misrepresented by uh, various people in government for years and years and years. And this is the most important part. There were lots of things destroyed by uh, the FBI and the CIA. The FBI destroyed that note that Oswald sent after the assassination, after it, saying that, oh, well, that's now he's dead now. This is after he was shot by Jack Ruby. Oh, he's dead now. We don't need to see this. Uh, what? 
that's a critical piece of information. It's evidence. And the CIA, of course, has never owned up to what they destroyed, almost certainly, in the 1960s and 1970s. So, uh, look, there are plenty of reasons to be cynical. There are plenty of justifications for criticism. I agree with most of them. But that doesn't mean that there was a conspiracy, because in the 1960s, like previous decades, it was entirely too easy for someone to shoot and kill a president. The amazing thing is that so many of them survived their time in office. So, and even now, you know, as, as we certainly improve the process tremendously in the Secret Service and outside the Secret Service, but even now, there is no way to protect a president at every moment of every day if you're going to let him out of the cage of the White House. Start a legacy. Start turning dreams into realities. A better world begins with you. Better communities start with us. So a couple of things. First of all, you did note that Lee Harvey Oswald wasn't even on the FBI watch list, which is is stunning to me, given what you just talked about, about the fact that he walked in and said he'd blow up the building. I mean, he'd well, be no, he was followed by an FBI agent and, and who checked in with him regularly uh, because he was a defector. This is James Hostey, the FBI agent who did this. So I would say the FBI kept some track of him. What we didn't really know until relatively recently is that the CIA, despite their protestations for decades, that they had no following. Oswald knew nothing about him. And, you know, even though he was one of, I think, nine United States defectors to the Soviet Union, what right. kind of idiot did you have to be to defect to the workers' paradise? I mean, it was obvious to the 99.9% .9 of the population. But the CIA was opening Oswald's mail at least as late as October 1963. They've hidden so much. And well, you also, you I, also I, point they're out, still not telling the full truth. They're just not. You also point out that he went to Mexico City and was shuttling, if you will, between the Cuban embassy and the Russian embassy, trying to get a visa to go to Russia. And yet with all of that background and people writing notes about him visiting and this and that, there's no video of him going into either embassy, which I found to be, you know, it's one of those other kind of suspicious things because we know that the CIA was watching both of those embassies and videoing people going in and out. And yet miraculously here he is shuttling back and forth, trying to get a visa. And lo and behold, there's no video from a CIA camera. Well, there are tapes of his calls to the embassy, but here's the incredible part. Do you know those tapes have just completely disappeared? But we, we do have transcripts apparently. Uh, who knows if they're the real transcripts or if right. they've changed any of it. But there is a photo of, of, um, of Lee Harvey Oswald, which was released uh, with him coming out of, um, I think it was the Soviet embassy. It was one of the two embassies in Mexico City that was released within days of the assassination. There's just one problem. It wasn't Lee Harvey Oswald. <laughs> Not even close. Not even close. He was, he was six foot tall and uh, and 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 uh, rather than five kind nine, early. a couple other things. Yeah, exactly. I mean, it's it's just you could not you couldn't create a series of activities and releases and statements that would lead more people to believe there was a conspiracy than what the U.S. government actually did. Some of it was on purpose and some of it was complete incompetence, like losing Lee Harvey Oswald's fingerprints. That was the FBI. Really? So, <laughs> so one of the things on that, Larry, the president, you lose the fingerprints? My God. One, one of the things that I thought was very interesting was that um, in 1963, assaulting or killing the president of the United States was not a federal crime. Correct. And talk about that for a moment as it relates to at the scene of the crime, the moment that President Kennedy was then driven to the hospital. You talk in the book extensively about Dallas PD stepping in, FBI, who's on first, what's on second, what happens to the limo, what happens to the evidence inside of the limo. There was a, you know, the limo was being cleaned literally by someone at the hospital rather than leaving the evidence in place. Talk through that, if you will, the, the in 1963, it was not a federal crime to assault a president of the United States. Therefore, there was no mandate that the FBI versus the Dallas police stepped in. Yes. And here's the good news. It now is a federal crime. How about right. that? They say we make no progress. 
1965. It's, you know, yeah, it, we, we a, make progress. We do. Make, it. But it's silly. Uh, and it, it took the it took the government getting a little off track until 1968, after the assassinations of Martin Luther King and Robert F. Kennedy uh, to ban mail order sales of rifles. You would think that after President Kennedy was killed for a grand total of nineteen dollars and ninety five cents. That's what it cost Oswald uh, via a, a pseudonym, A. Hidel, uh, to buy that rifle, uh, that it took that long to do that one tiny thing. But of course, we have no place to talk. We still haven't outlawed uh, AK-47s or AR-15s, right? We did for a period of time, and then it lapsed. And now anybody can just come on in, and on the right day, you might not even get the records that indicate they're not qualified to buy one. So we we are doing just as poor a job, if not worse, than than our predecessors did in the 1960s. But anyway, uh, there was a fight between the corridor uh, there in Dallas, who insisted, as the Secret Service were pulling the uh, and carrying the coffin of President Kennedy with Kennedy's body in it to put in the ambulance to take to Air Force One to fly back to Washington. And he interrupts them and says, oh, where are you going? You can't do that. Uh, the law here in Texas is that when there's a murder, you must have the autopsy done right here, right here, right now. Well, how long will that take? The Secret Service uh, men asked. And he said, well, could be 8, 10, 24 hours, maybe longer. <laughs> Can you imagine making Mrs. Kennedy wait there and, and not allow? Well, I guess the president could have flown back. The new president could have flown back on Air Force One, but he would have received a great deal of criticism for leaving the president's spot, President Kennedy's body there. Basically, the Secret Service, and I don't blame them, they were on the verge of drawing their guns. And they said, buddy, get out of the way. We're gone. We're out of here. And they did. They took, and the guy stepped aside. The irony is he was right. <laughs> that was a Texas law. Right. But, you know, uh, sometimes common sense has to overtake a law. And, and fortunately, it did in this case, though it never should have gotten to the confrontation that we saw. It's really interesting, Larry, because then after the 1965 law was passed, which made it a, a federal offense to assault a president um, or, well, assault is the actual term. It's obviously anything, including um, killing them, that when John Hinckley shot Ronald Reagan, that he went to the D.C. jail and then was taken down I-95 to Quantico and was held at Quantico under Marine Guard because at that time it was actually a federal law. Therefore, federal officials stepped in and took control of him so that you didn't have the same thing that happened at the Dallas jailhouse as it relates to Lee Harvey Oswald and Jack Ruby. Yes. And and again, you know, I'm not a great fan of, of Jagger Hoover, that's for sure, especially given everything we've learned and, you know, his his uh, wiretaps on Martin Luther King and all the rest of it. But I will give I will give Hoover this. Hoover was very worried about the incompetence of the Dallas Police Department. And he called on Saturday, the day after the assassination, to talk to Jesse Curry, the police chief, who had assured Dallas ahead of time that absolutely nothing would happen. Everything was covered. There's no way for anything to happen. Uh, and uh, he, because Hoover had heard that a lot of threats were being made against Oswald by uh, some local, some out of the out of the Dallas area, people who were obviously enraged by what Oswald had been accused of doing, and I think did in fact do. Uh, and uh, Jesse Curry refused um, Hoover's request that the FBI take over that process in order to protect the accused assassin to make sure that he got to trial, assuring Hoover that that uh, every resource would be devoted to protecting Oswald. Well, we all know what happened. Uh, really, the the incompetence, the incompetence there is still leaves me slack jawed. Yeah, it's really quite something. I mean, they even they didn't even actually charge him. Right. So he met with the press. You, you point this out in your book, Larry, that they, the Dallas police allowed Oswald to be questioned by the press corps before he'd even been charged with a crime. Well, e even worse than that, you look at the films of the hallways 
uh, where they were taking Oswald out of the interrogation room and taking him down to the to the public room where the press could could ask questions and so on. Back and forth and back and forth. You couldn't even move in those hallways. There were so many people crammed in there because, of course, press from around the world had come in and the police did not know who was really in there. And now we have photos and film of none other than Jack Ruby being right there. It's possibly could have killed Oswald on Friday night, the night of the assassination. Uh, again, just unbelievable incompetence. Yeah, it's, it, it is really um, quite something. Um, let's talk for a moment, Larry, about the Kennedy legacy, only in that, as I think about you, you in the book, you talk a lot about the, um, well, first of all, the 1956 Democratic um, uh, convention and where Kennedy kind of stepped to the fore as a potential national figure. Uh, and I thought it was fascinating in that in the, in, in, that at that time, uh, in looking at who would become vice president. Um, fortunately, he didn't become vice president in 1956 because that probably would have been a death knell for his political future. Um, but interestingly, there are a lot of names that pop up, including Al Gore from Tennessee, who uh, Senior. Al Gore's father, Senior, Senior yeah, right. exactly, who takes the Tennessee delegates and puts them to a uh, to a Senator Kennedy from uh, the great state of Massachusetts. Um but you you go into the 1960 election and Kennedy v. Nixon. And I think about it in the context of that was the advent of the television era. And it was very clear that this young, good looking senator from Massachusetts was going to um, completely outshow the vice president at that time on the national debate. And that's been widely talked about. But as I thought about it, Larry, I was thinking about where we are today. And whether we're at the point where politics is evolving from the television era to the online era. And if you think about how Trump won the 16 election and using social media so effectively and going direct to the consumer rather than going through television and through the established press corps, um, is sort of 2024, 2020, a changing of the media in the way that the 1960 election was a move from print to television um, and, and and sort of to some degree, what does that mean about the success of future candidates? Because we've now gone through this 60 year period where if you were good on television and you knew how to control that medium, you probably had a better shot at national politics than not. Well, it, we certainly had a tremendous change because of social media. I think television is still important. It still reaches tens of millions of people. Uh, all the major networks reach tens of millions of people. And when you add but, that- but Let me just jump in there for a second, because you point out in your book that 70 million people watched the Kennedy-Nixon debate, which is yeah. almost as many people as voted in the election. Today, I mean, I don't know how many, you know this better than I do, how many people watched the last Republican debate on cable television? Did it get 3 million viewers? Oh, no, it got, they've gotten between 10 and 20 million okay. for each of their debates. But remember, it's a, it's a primary uh, debate. It, it's, in fact, you don't even have the candidate who's leading by a mile, Donald Trump, in the mix. So I'm surprised they've gotten as many as they as they have to watch it. Uh, and I'm not I'm not saying one way or another whether the debates were worthwhile, but it's better to have them than not. I'm going to be interested to see whether we actually have them next fall. That is by no means guaranteed. Just because the Presidential Debate Commission issued dates and places does not mean they're really going to be held. The well, but talk about that because you point out you point out after Nixon got beaten so badly by Kennedy that in 64, 68, and 72, Johnson and Kennedy and Nixon didn't participate in the debates, correct? Yes, we didn't get them back until 1976 because both candidates, Gerald Ford and Jimmy Carter, needed debates. Ford needed to prove, and he thought he could prove, that he had far more in information and competence than Jimmy Carter did. And Jimmy Carter, who was unknown, really, except Georgia, outside of Georgia, he also needed to demonstrate to people that he was ready to be president. So uh, that's why we got him back. And once we got him back, it the pressure increased on candidates to accept them. Though, you know, in 1980, we, we only had one Reagan-Carter debate. There was a Reagan-John Anderson debate. Um, and there have been other years. Well, one was canceled uh, uh, last time between Biden and Trump. 
I think Trump canceled it. So this, this is a very tenuous tradition. I'd rather have them than not. I hope we have them. But I also agree with the critics who say debating ability is not the only thing we should be basing our vote on. Somebody could be very good at memorizing uh, sound bites and uh, can come across well in a debate, but can be very ill-suited to the Oval Office. So we, we also, as an electorate, need some maturity. And that, that's a laugh. I hope everybody's laughing when I talk about the electorate having maturity. <laughs> Well, so when you talk about maturity, Kennedy was 47 when elected president. Am I? He was 43. 43, excuse me. And he was you 46 talk- when he was killed. 46 years old. Yeah. Think about it. I'm in my 70s. 46 years old. The man had his head blown off. I mean, it. it that's why on Wednesday of this week, as you said, two days ago, the 60th anniversary of the assassination, I was struck by how emotional so many people were in person and interviews on social media. Um, It just, you know, I lived through it myself and it was, it was so traumatic. Um, My friends and I, we all had nightmares for ages about it. And for us, uh, even though 9-11, we lost around 3000 Americans in, in that sense, it was much more serious, but not really because this was the Cold War era, and it was the president of the United States, and he was the youngest president ever elected. And it was it was and he was murdered in a vicious way, sitting next to his wife in every way possible. It was horrible. And that's why people who live through it can't forget it and won't forget it. You also in the book, Larry, talk about the fact that his legacy is one that really shines brighter than almost anybody else because of it being arrested, because it was cut off short. And that if you look at it from an overall policy accomplishment standpoint, he is there above two-term presidents who had massive, massive accomplishments like a Reagan, like a Clinton. Um, and yet Kennedy still stays on top of it because of the image we had with him. And, and you, you and Peter Hart did some polling as it relates to why is it that Kennedy sits so far above others? And it was so fascinating to think about how the, 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 the history is, is, is somewhat privileged because of the way in which he went out. And it's just interesting from a psychological standpoint to look back on it and look at all of your writing and the research that you and Peter Hart did on it. No, that's, and and it's certainly true that uh, the gauzy retrospective is not often uh, fully accurate. Uh, For example, in civil rights, uh, was Kennedy on the right side? Yes. Did it take him forever to get there? Yes. Uh, Could he have passed the civil rights bill that Lyndon Johnson passed? No, he had a much weaker version uh, in there. But of course, Johnson was able to pass it. Yes, because he was he was a legislative magician. He was a wizard with uh, Congress. But also it was because of the memory of JFK being murdered. Uh, JFK's assassination gave Johnson the ability to pass all of that great society legislation, at least the first two years of it, because the Kennedy assassination gave him an enormous Democratic majority in both the Senate and the House. So Kennedy deserves some credit for what Johnson passed on the domestic side. We'll leave Vietnam aside for the time being. Although, again, Johnson was the one who sent the the troops from, you know, 15,000 to 535,000, 535,000. By the time he left office. So, you know, you have to look at it from that perspective. But getting back to why Kennedy gets credit for all that, Kennedy was elevated to secular sainthood. That's a phrase I've used for many, many years um, because of the assassination. We didn't know about his personal foibles and things like that. Uh, We didn't know about him until the 1970s. And enough time had passed so that people could put that into some perspective. Uh, But people people felt guilt, even those who had voted for Kennedy, I guess, felt some guilt about what had happened. And they felt terrible for Mrs. Kennedy and the children. There were constant reminders of what had happened. And that elevated Kennedy's importance in people's minds. But there's another factor that people rarely mention. Willie, and this is important. I teach a course on Kennedy almost every semester. There are about 150 students in there. 
Needless to say, they were all born in this century. <laughs> they have no memory, living memory whatsoever of John F. Kennedy. But I'll tell you what's interesting. When I play tapes of some of his key speeches and press conferences, they are riveted. They pay attention to everything he's saying. They have questions about it. When I show, as I do, other presidents giving talks and speeches that were at least as important, if not more so, than what Kennedy was talking about, their eyes glaze over. They daydream. Huh. Kennedy was riveting. He still is. He could appear, as Jackie could, on the street of any American community today, and if unrecognized, could walk up and down the street because he fits right in. How many other presidents fit right in? Most of them were outdated when they were in office, much less decades later. But when I hear that, I think about my, I, I didn't know until I read your book and look back on it, but my impression would have been that Kennedy was this star force, that he rolled to election in 1960, and that every word that came out of his mouth was accepted by the American people as God's word. And actually, as you point out in the book, he barely won the 1960 election. He won quite handily on the electoral side, on the popular vote side. He didn't have a large margin we over Nixon. And that there was plenty of question marks as it relates to the veracity of the 1960 election. And so I sit here and think about 2020 and everything that we've been dealing with on 2020 versus back in 1960 and, and, and Richard Nixon's ability at that time to have contested the election. He did not. You write extensively about Mayor Daley in Chicago and how Chicago, there were, I think it was 320,000 uh, plus victory margin of victory for Kennedy in Chicago, Chicago. and yet in the state of Illinois, it was nothing <laughs> close to that. Um, yeah. And so it's just, it's an interesting thing because you do talk about the fact that he came into office really without a mandate. And while we all look back on his inaugural address as this wonderful speech that Ted Sorensen wrote and he delivered it so well and asked not what you can do for, ask not what your nation can do for you, ask what you can do for your nation. Um, you think about those things and yet you put it into the context he didn't really have a mandate coming into being president of the United States. No, he didn't. I, one small correction, because people say this all the time. That was actually Kennedy's phrase. Ask not what your country can do for you. Ask what you can do for your country. Because one of his prep school masters had, uh, had repeatedly used that sentence or something very much like it. So you know, I'm sure Ted Sorensen added something to it, but their relationship, JFK and Ted Sorensen, I just had Ted Sorensen's widow here to talk uh, with students about uh, their relationship. Uh, they, they were just perfect for one another in coming up with ideas, shaping them, polishing them. And a lot of presidents don't have that. But yes, it, look, almost every member of Congress, both the House and the Senate, who were, who were up in 1960, got a much larger percentage of the vote than JFK did in their district or state. So they had no great obligation, the Democrats didn't, to support uh, what uh, Kennedy was doing. They said, hey, I've got a bigger mandate than you do among the only people who matter to me, which are the people who can either reelect me or defeat me. So he was weak. Uh, he had barely gotten in. The Catholic factor still mattered. And my students today just laugh. They can't believe that was ever a matter of substance in politics. It explains the whole vote. Kennedy got 80% of the Roman Catholic vote, and Nixon got almost 70% of the Protestant vote. It was an election about religion as much as, a, as, much as party or anything else. It really, really mattered. And uh, Protestants at the time, millions of them, believed that Kennedy was a puppet for the Pope. And that the Pope would be calling him up. This is hard to believe. The Pope would be calling him up every morning and giving him his instructions for what to do that day. <laughs> I mean, you know, you can't make this stuff up. And it just, it reminds all of us how irrational human beings are, not just Americans, all of us. It's in the genome. And uh, maybe one day when we have better genetic engineering, we'll be able to do something about it. But for the time being, we're stuck with that genome. And it explains so much about, uh, about human behavior, whether it's the U.S. or Russia or Ukraine or the Middle East. One of the other fascinating things that you point out in the book, and I'm big on 
setting bold, highly ambitious goals for my team at Walker and Dunlop. And we've been really successful, Larry, at setting these five-year uh, Jim Collins, bold, highly ambitious BHAGs. And one of the things that you point out in the book that I thought was fascinating was that when they were talking about a space program and, and Russia, USSR at the time, was ahead of us on exploring space, um, and that Kennedy originally wanted to set the goal of going to Mars. Mm -hmm. And it was only through other conversations that said, we're never, we're not going to get to Mars anytime in our lifetime to do something that's actually achievable, which is getting to the moon. And I just find it to be incredible because had he said it as Mars, we, we never would have gotten there. Wouldn't have gotten there. And <laughs> not in that, but, not in that decay, that's for sure. <laughs> without a doubt. But the, the idea of setting an achievable goal rather than this just far out there goal, if you'd said get to Mars, everyone's been like, we're not going to get there. But getting it to the moon was something that was achieve highly ambitious, clearly, but achievable. And I, I found it to be fascinating, even in presidential politics and even in setting out a, a a path for a nation, that the goal can be ambitious, but boy oh boy, it better be achievable. Yes. And, and look, Kennedy, Kennedy knew that he was young. He was inspirational in his, in his rhetoric. Uh, and he, he knew that it fit the new frontier, the name of his administration perfectly. The idea of, of really opening up space. And as you mentioned, we were not in good shape, certainly not compared to the, to the Russians who had, who beat us, uh, terribly on just about every significant goal until, uh, probably the mid '60s, we started overtaking them a little bit during Kennedy's administration. But he set the wheels in motion, and he set the goal. If it hadn't been for Kennedy, I don't think we would have had that goal. In fact, I'm certain we wouldn't have had the goal to go to the moon by the end of the of the '60s, and we we certainly wouldn't have met that goal. But Kennedy Kennedy did want it to be dramatic because he believed correctly that was the future. If we could go, you know, 500 years into the future, you know. I hope, God willing, that the United States is still here or that human beings are still here. But if we could go 500 years into the future, I'm convinced that that will be the most significant piece of the Kennedy administration, the emphasis on space and setting us on the path to explore the heavens. That was Kennedy's goal. He talked early on with the NASA administrator, whose name was Jim Webb, not the U.S. Senator from Virginia, but another relation? James Webb, the, no uh, the, the uh, telescope in space right now that we see uh, photos from all the time. That was uh, James Webb, head of NASA. And and he said, look, we, we need to, to be dramatic. Well, I think we ought to go to Mars. And, and uh, the administrator said, Mr. President, that is just not achievable. He was very blunt with him and explained why. And, and Kennedy uh, was able to process that information very quickly and realize the moon was achievable, as you said, and Mars was not. Uh, now, look, there were plenty of people who criticized Kennedy at the time saying, we're not going to get to the moon and we're going to be very embarrassed. We don't even have uh, launch vehicles big enough to, to go to the moon. How are we going to develop these things? There were, there were the usual critics. But America was very optimistic at the time. We were still in that post-World War II glow. We were, we were running the world in a lot of respects. We were clearly the strongest superpower, much stronger than the Soviet Union, as we learned later. Uh, but um, Kennedy uh, knew that this, this was the time to act. Americans were ready for dramatic action. And, and it was something that, that everybody could agree to. You know, the conservatives were very anti-Soviet Union. They didn't want the Soviet Union to beat us in that because I remember my dad taking me out to the backyard in 1957. I was five years old uh, so we could watch Sputnik go, uh, go ahead. Sputnik was about this big, but we could see it. It was well lit by the sun. And we were in awe that, that uh, human beings had managed to do this. Think of that, that tiny little thing. But we also were afraid because we knew if you could put a satellite up there like Sputnik, then you could put weapons in space and we could have nuclear weapons raining down from space. So you see, we had awe and we had fear. And that combination was able to unite most Americans behind the Kennedy Space Program. Let's shift, Larry, from... 60 years ago to today um, on your website last week, um, the title was Dem strong in last week's election. Um, below that, it said there were a half dozen key races we were watching. 
the Kentucky and Mississippi gubernatorial races, an abortion rights ballot issue in Ohio, a Pennsylvania state Supreme Court race, and both chambers of the Virginia state legislature. Democrats won five of these six races, losing only the Mississippi gubernatorial race. Those are the facts. How should we read into them? Uh, we should read into them that Democrats had a very good day. A lot of it was due to abortion rights and the conservative Republican Supreme Court's overturning of Roe v. Wade, which has turned out to be massively unpopular. I mean, massively. So that even in deep red states, you have upwards of 60 percent disagreeing with what the court did. And obviously in more liberal states, it's 70, 75 percent. Uh, so it was a disaster politically, whatever you think about the policy. And I don't want to get into discussing abortion one way or the other or both ways. Uh, but uh, that was what was significant about the election. And now we have a full year to go before the next election. OK, so you don't stretch elections beyond uh, their their true meaning. And the half-life of an election is really quite, quite short. So uh, what does it mean for next year? You know, you can go back into history and say, well, you know, in most cases, it gave a hint of what was going to happen in the presidential race. But there were certainly cases where it didn't. So we need to focus on the present and the future, not what happened in a handful of races in early November of 2023. Does Andy Bashir, being the governor of Kentucky have any impact there as it relates? I mean, Kentucky is solidly red. How did, I mean, yeah. you've always said, Larry, I, 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 you know, you've told me before many, many times, hey, Willie, good candidates win. Uh, is he, I mean, is that is that another case in Kentucky that just Andy Bashir was, w was better than Daniel Cameron? And as a result of that, he's got the governorship, but don't think that all of a sudden Kentucky's a blue state? Yeah, well, that pretty much summarizes it. Anybody who <laughs> thinks, look, Kentucky was 60% for Trump. Uh, anybody who thinks that any Democratic nominee next year, Biden or somebody else, is going to even do well in Kentucky, much less win, doesn't know much about politics. Uh, Andy Bashir was was a very good, ideal candidate. He had to be four years ago. I mean, he won by like 5,000 votes against an incumbent Republican governor. Everything had to go perfectly for him to win, even though he was a much better candidate and he was much better liked than the Republican incumbent. And this time, uh, the same was true. And he'd had four years to demonstrate that he was good at handling disasters, which unfortunately, poor Kentucky has had more than its share of over the past few years. Uh, so it says a lot about Andy Bashir. Maybe Andy Bashir should be considered for the Democratic ticket in 2028, uh, simply because he could reestablish the Democratic tie with at least some rural areas. Uh, not going to carry Kentucky, never going to carry West Virginia again, at least not in our lifetime, but could potentially make enough difference in states like Ohio, which has a lot of rural area, uh, to make Ohio competitive again, which currently it is not. It is it is not as heavily Republican as Kentucky or West Virginia, but it's 54-46 Republican, and that's that's pretty uh, weighted toward the GOP for a state like Ohio. So, yeah, I mean, it was interesting. Uh, I know Andy Bashir um, is very pleased with the victory. Democrats like to cite it. But in terms of its meaning for 2024, I think our talk right now probably has as much meaning which is to say, not much at all. But I, I find it to be interesting when you use West Virginia as an example, only because you know the history of it. And, and were it not for Karl Rove and George W. Bush saying West Virginia is one of those swing states that we can go win. I mean, back in 2000, not this is not ancient history. Back in 2000, West Virginia was up in the, it was a toss up state between Democrats and Republicans. And now here we are 23 years later, and it is, it's the first state that you jump to after Kentucky to say it ain't going Democratic anytime in the near future. It's just amazing how quickly the political tide can shift in in, in any of these states. I mean, that that's, we're not talking about, you know, we're not talking about Mississippi and Alabama and some other states that for a very, very long period of time have been ingrained uh, red. And, and I just find that to be interesting that that's the first state you pull up. Well, Look, I, of course, I grew up in West Virginia. My, my mother's family is all from Southwest Virginia, very near the West Virginia border. And uh, they were heavily Democratic back then. They voted for Michael Dukakis. 
Yeah. <laughs> I mean, it, it, that's how heavily Democratic they were. And in 2000, uh, Bush and Rove and others involved in that campaign used abortion and guns. Those were the two issues that switched West Virginia and Tennessee. Al Gore's own state that he had represented in the U.S. Senate, that uh, the Clinton-Gore ticket had carried handily twice. If he just carried Tennessee, he would have been president. If he just carried West Virginia, he would have been president. So, um, it, and it, it was a cultural change. That's what did it. Uh, the Democratic Party increasingly became the party of college graduates, and the Republican Party increasingly became the party of those without a, the benefit of a college education. It's only become more so. Donald Trump accelerated it. And that's the big division, uh, every bit as much as race and gender in our politics today. So while we're on West Virginia, Senator Manchin is not going to run for re-election to the Senate. Um, Mitt Romney is not going to run for re-election in the state of Utah. Um, First of all, let's talk about the potential for a third party candidate. I guess we already have Kennedy out there as a third party candidate running as an independent now. Um, what's your thought, Larry, as it relates to the viability of um, either the Kennedy candidacy that's already out there or a Romney or Manchin ticket that steps forward and says we need to present an alternative to this two party system, particularly that has Trump and Biden as their nominees? Well, my guess is today that I, certainly Romney won't run, and I doubt Joe Manchin does, no matter what he's saying now. Uh, and the reason is because uh, that potentially is the no labels ticket. Um, Larry Hogan, the former governor of, of, of uh, Maryland, may be more likely to to run uh, as the presidential nominee for that for that ticket. But frankly, um, it, it could easily, I'm not predicting it will this far in advance, but it could easily deliver the election to Donald Trump. And if there's one thing Joe Manchin and most people, including I think Larry Hogan, don't want to be tagged with in history, it's giving Donald Trump a second term. Uh, so we'll see how that actually works out. Robert F. Kennedy Jr., of course, um, look, uh, he wasn't going to do anything in the Democratic Party. There was no way he was going to even come close to Joe Biden. He's running as an independent, and some polls have him over 20 percent. That's often true with third party candidates early in the process before people start focusing on the real choice between the Democratic and Republican nominee. Um, but we thought he would hurt Biden at first. Now it looks like he could potentially take more votes from Trump as an independent. But then you have the other third party and independent candidates, you know, Cornell West, but there may be some people who vote who wouldn't have voted otherwise, but the vast majority of his votes are going to come right out of Joe Biden's column. Uh, you have uh, Jill Stein running again. You know, there's a good argument to be made that she cost Hillary Clinton, Michigan, and maybe other states, Wisconsin, in uh, 2016. And she's back and she can only hurt Biden as a nominee of the Green Party. Uh, you have um, beyond that. Um, the Libertarians may nominate. I haven't heard any names mentioned yet, but they usually put a, a national candidate for president up. Who that will hurt depends on who it is. So it's going to be an interesting mix of candidates. And I still say probably the total uh, total uh, result of those uh, third party and independent candidates will be helpful to Trump and not Biden. And that's because Trump has a ceiling. And his ceiling is below 50 percent. You can argue whether it's 46 or 47 or 48, but he's below 50. He never got over 50 a single day of his presidency. Even the first day, he didn't get over 50. Uh, so as you as you reduce the percentage necessary for him to get an electoral college majority uh, and Hillary beat him by two points in the popular vote. So he only needs 45, 46 percent to win the election. Um, as you get as you pull votes out, you increase the chances of a second Trump presidency having lost the popular vote again. But that's not what elects presidents in the United States. You can say it's foolish and we should have gone to a new system decades or centuries ago. But facts are facts. And we're not ever going to change that and by ever. I mean, as far as we can see the future. Inform people what happens if Trump or Biden 
doesn't win enough electoral votes to win the presidency in the general. In other words, a third party candidate comes in and takes up enough electoral votes that no one gets enough to get over what is needed to be president of the United States. What happens? Well, if the if a third party candidate or more than one actually wins electoral votes, and that's tough to do, they have to be sectional candidates. Ross Bro got 19 percent of the vote and didn't win a single electoral vote back in 1992. So it's not easy to do. George Wallace was a sectional candidate and won more than 40 electoral votes uh, by carrying some deep south states. So if 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 any electoral votes go to a third party candidate and if 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 those votes make the difference between no one getting 270 and somebody getting 270 or over. Uh, then I assume the third party candidate can bargain with those electoral votes, assuming the electors will do what the candidate uh, wants them to do. Uh, that's what Wallace had intended to do if he had made the difference between uh, 270 and not for Nixon or Humphrey. He was going to negotiate with those electoral votes. But if if nobody gets 270 and uh, the other electoral votes don't go to one of the two major candidates, then we kick in a provision of the Constitution that hasn't been used since 1824, thankfully, because it's going to be a bloody disaster. Uh, and that is every state, every state gets one vote. California gets one vote. Texas gets one vote. Rhode Island gets one vote. Wyoming gets one vote. In other words, the least populated states, the Dakotas each get a vote. Uh, and you have to get 26 votes to be elected president, a majority of the states. Well, the odds are, and we'll wait for the election, but the odds are Republicans are going to control the delegations in at least 26 states. That's the way it looks right now. Maybe it'll change. That's the way it looks right now. So you could have uh, a candidate losing by millions of popular votes uh, who uh, is elected by the House of Representatives with the gargantuan California and gargantuan Texas having one vote and those small states each having a vote. And the, the scary part is some of the other states, if they have, say, three Republicans and three Democrats representing them in the House or whatever the number is, if it splits equally, they will get zero votes, zero votes for president, zero. Think about that and the anger that will be generated by that. So it's a nightmare. It should have been changed decades ago. I understand why it was put in to begin with. We didn't even have popular elections. We didn't have real votes until 1824. So I understand why it got in there, but it should have been ditched years ago. And of course we haven't because we only respond to a crisis. We're very good at responding to a crisis. And that's all we're good at responding to. I love going back to the summer of 2007 when you said very clearly, and at that time, Rudy Giuliani and Hillary Clinton were without a doubt the two nominees for the Republican and Democrats. And you said um, that ain't going to be the ticket that people are going to be voting on a year and a half from now. And you were exactly right. Neither one of them made it. Um, as you look now a year away from next November, uh, is the ticket that people are, is the ballot in front of people when they walk into their polling stations a year from now, Trump and Biden, or does something change? Well, when you've got an incumbent president who's 81 and you've got the main challenger, Donald Trump, being by then 78, uh, I'm not going to tell people the probability is anything <laughs> because, uh, you know, I'm here to tell you I'm a lot younger than them, not a lot younger than they are, you know. Uh, six, seven, eight years younger than they are. And things go wrong with some frequency when you get older. That's just the way it is. So that is something that we really haven't had to consider very often. Uh, maybe 1984 with Reagan, maybe 1956 with Eisenhower. But it's it's rare that you have to think about that. And so that factor uh, is is not part of the calculus. It can't be part of the calculus. But obviously, Trump is way ahead on the Republican side and Biden is way ahead on the Democratic side. But a lot's going to happen between now and next November. So if you if you had to put odds on us walking in and seeing a Trump-Biden ballot, 
Well, it's the likelihood today. It's still the likelihood. <laughs> it's the likelihood mind, today. Like yeah. And we're, we're, we're in, uh, you know, a year away. And, and sadly we're out of time. I'd go into much more detail. I know. So my one other question. <laughs> I tell, then. I'd tell you more precisely, like, Willie, but we just don't have time. You, you shouldn't right. have spent so much on JFK. It's your I know. fault. Exactly. My bad. My <laughs> final one is this. I had thought that Glenn Youngkin by not going into the Republican primary would stay unscathed by what's going on between Nikki Haley and the other Republicans running for it and would present potentially the white knight for the Republican Party if you're getting to a convention next summer and maybe Donald Trump's been convicted and people say, okay, this just isn't, I mean, he can still serve, but that's not going to get us there. We've got to shift and that Glenn Youngkin would be the white knight for the Republican Party. The showing in the election week before last in Virginia, where he pushed really hard to win both the House and the Senate, and it both stayed Democratic, seemed to be a rebuke to that sort of Yonkin candidacy. Is that reading too much into a very difficult Virginia state legislature dynamic? Or is that true that Yonkin has been slowed down in his path? Well, he's certainly been slowed down, but I don't think it had any major effect on the vote because that's not why voters vote. That's not how voters vote. They vote about real issues that matter to them, like abortion rights one way or the other. That had much more to do with the result in Virginia than did Youngkin's uh, presidential ambitions. But I have to tell you, on that one, many of us were right because the people saying that Youngkin could slip in that way were operating from a mindset that died decades ago. We don't have party leadership running, uh, certainly the Republican Party choice for president, and to some degree, the Democratic choice, though there's more of it still on the Democratic side. You don't have leaders sitting in a back room, a smoke-filled room, or even smokeless back room, picking candidates. It doesn't work like that anymore. It's, it's a broad electorate, although it's a narrow electorate. Well, on the right for the Republicans, center left for the Democrats, which is why they can pick a Biden who was wasn't nearly as far to the left as some of the other Democratic candidates in 2020. But if you think the Trump electorate, <laughs> which will be there whether Trump is or, or not, if you think they were going to let some big shots, the big boys pick Glenn Youngkin, you know, a half billionaire, maybe he's worth more than that. Uh, who's from out of the old mold, who certainly has has governed conservatively, but is is hardly a populist. If you think that they were going to pick him, then, you know, we're uh, obviously you got a time machine and we have gone back several decades. And I'd love to I'd love to do that, assuming I would be as young as I was several decades ago. If you've got <laughs> one, let me let me borrow it. Give it to me as a Christmas gift. Uh, Willie, will you do that? Well, this was a very nice Thanksgiving gift for you to take time during this week to join me, Larry. Um, we will be back. We will dive into the issues as we get into 24. I'm super, super thankful of your time. Um, happy late Thanksgiving. Um, thank you for taking the time. Great to see you and everyone who joined us today. Uh, I hope you found this discussion with Larry is as insightful and fun as I did. It was a lot of fun. Thank you, Willie. It's great to see you. Take care, Larry. Take Thanks. Care.